Hello and welcome to the Alatia Foundation's podcast series. Here, experts share their insights on current and urgent energy matters for our esteemed members and the general community. My name is Stephen Cole, and I'm joined today by Tom Ellicott from Wood Mackenzie. Tom is an FVP on Wood Mackenzie's corporate research team, which includes the corporate service M&A service, and the corporate benchmarking tool. So let's not uh, delay any further and say good afternoon, Tom, and welcome to the programme. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, and it's great to be on the call today. Well, the, the Foundation certainly thanks you and Woodmac for their continuing support and collaboration with us. The, the events at the ExxonMobil and Chevron board meetings may have been a surprise to the public, but hopefully and obviously not to their board members. They'll have seen who the members were of the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative. Do you think, though, they were surprised that the shareholders finally acted on fossil fuel emissions? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is an indication of just the direction of travel and uh, shareholder and stakeholder pressure in general has, has been ratcheting up. Uh, really since the Paris Agreement was signed back in 2015. Uh, and that pressure continues to intensify. Now, the events of May the 26th, we've actually termed it uh, a big day for big oil. Um, it did sort of feel a bit of a watershed moment, the fact that you had such uh, three big events happening on the on the same day. Uh, but um, in, in some ways, it's a sort of signpost, albeit a very big signpost of the direction of travel um, and just the pressure that oil and gas companies are coming under to decarbonise and, uh, and address uh, climate related risk. Well, we'll come on to climate uh, in a moment, but the, the court rule, the shell court rule must have also been a bit of a surprise to uh, a traditionally, anyway, very conservative company. So. Will Shell go along with this ruling or will it appeal? Yeah, it, it, it had, it's immediately effective. Um, and uh, Shell has said that uh, it will accelerate its decarbonisation plans. Um, and um, it's indicated that it does intend to appeal. But the fact that it's immediately effective uh, means that it, uh, that it does actually have to accelerate its plans to decarbonise. Basically, the ruling was to, um, part of the ruling was um, to reduce absolute scope three emissions by 45% by uh, 2030. In order to do that, it, it basically implies that uh, Shell will have to shrink its oil and gas production. Um, so it would mean uh, more, more disposals in order to reduce that uh, overall uh, output and, and emissions in um, absolute emissions production. Let's look at the what I think is a bit of a divide between the US and Europe, because the other European IOCs seem to be embracing the need for change more readily than US based ones. Because, it, as you know, it wasn't that long ago that commentators were very surprised at the pivot by BP. It's now appearing that they were ahead of the game. Total and ENI also appear to be changing their stance. So what are your thoughts on, 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 on this matter? Yeah, I mean, I think when you analyse the strategies, you're basically seeing different pathways to net zero emerge. And um, uh, the US majors are still sticking with what we've termed the big old business model, uh, but they're starting to push harder things like um, carbon capture and uh, longer term that could emerge into uh, carbon as a service, a new profit centre. Uh, and then the um, euro majors have embraced much more new energy, so wind and solar. Uh, what is interesting, though, is you're also seeing strategic divergence among the euro majors. So you have BP at one end of the spectrum with its plans to shrink its oil and gas production by 40 percent this decade, whilst aggressively pivoting into into new energy. Uh, and then you have Total, Total Energies, which uh, is has still got big plans to grow oil and gas over the next five to 10 years. Um, and yet it's been very much a pace setter in moving into wind and solar and new energies in general. Well, what do you think then has caused the institutional investors to become more proactive on climate change? Is it coming from the shareholders? Yeah, I mean, I think the institutional investors um, also sort of uh, have, uh, are facing pressures to respond to climate related risk. And um, sort of that's one of the, the drivers. And uh, they need to understand uh, the risk that these that, that companies are under from uh, climate change and the strategic response to deal with that. 
Uh, but I think it's also a reflection of, uh, of just the general pressure that institutional investors are also under. Yeah, it, it must be huge pressure, to be honest, and it's yeah. non-stop and it won't go away either, will it? It, it won't. It won't. I think this is only going in one direction. But um, it, it's a it's it's a long journey, and um, the reason you have so much strategic divergence is there's enormous uncertainty. Um, if you look at the spectrum of demand projections to 2050, it is um, it, it it's massive, and uh, and of course that impacts price. Uh, so that that's one reason you're seeing. Uh, a lot of strategic divergence. But what's absolutely clear is um, all companies need to prioritise decarbonisation. Yeah, yeah, that, that is crystal clear, isn't it? Do you think, you mentioned price, do you think there may be a, a lack of investment in, in the oil and gas industry that results in uh, occasional supply shortages and instability in prices? I think that's a real risk. It very much depends on what happens to demand. Um, so if you see an accelerated transition, um, basically what you need to get on a one and a half degree pathway, you start to see demand falling um, in the near term, really. Uh, but the, the, there's also a scenario where you've got demand growth for at least another decade. Um, and one of the um, all, all the majors as part of their strategy, a core part of their strategy is future proofing the legacy oil and gas portfolio. And that basically means it needs to be resilient to a range of scenarios and particularly resilient to lower prices. Um, so they're all being very disciplined in allocating capital to new projects. Um, there's a shift towards short cycle projects rather than the big long life um, oil and gas developments that the majors used to tackle. Um, and it's not just the majors, you know, you're seeing this throughout the sector with the exception of, sort of some resource holding NOCs. So that, 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 that is a risk that sort of uh, disciplined approach to oil and gas investment could, uh, could be fueling sort of overall underinvestment. And if demand continues to grow, um, that sort of would ultimately lead to higher prices. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you think other independent oil and gas producers and the vast array of their suppliers will now follow suit and uh, either curtail or realign their businesses? Yeah, you're starting to see it happen. And I think with the events of the 26th of May, that there'll also be a trickle down effect to the independents. And I mean, the US independents, the pressure's ratcheting up among that peer group. And you, you've seen a uh, raft of, of net zero targets being announced by the US independents. And, and I think uh, you, you get that there will be more of those announced. Um, so uh, you are starting to see that pressure from uh, stakeholders trickle down to the next tier. Um, and, uh, you know, all companies need to work out what is their decarbonisation strategy and what is their strategy for the longer term to ensure sustainability through the energy transition. I'd like to hear your thoughts now on the uh, independent U.S. shale oil and gas producers. They're typically, as you know, highly geared. Will they be able to carry on long term if their sources of finance dry up? And will their free cash flow be sufficient to finance the continuous drilling that, as you know, is required or needed for shale operations? Yeah, well, I mean, they've, they've gone through an enormous um, capital allocation change um, during the pandemic. Um, up until the pandemic, for many, many years, they were outspending their, their cash flow generation. Um, it was debt fueled growth, basically, which resulted in, in their gearing or leverage increasing. What we've seen now, though, Stephen, is that um, these companies as a group are now uh, reinvesting just 50 percent of their operating cash flow into investment. So they're basically churning out a lot of free cash flow, particularly at current prices. Um, and that's helped them accelerate net debt reduction. Uh, and that will continue if we see the sort of prices we have today um, it, it sustained over, over, the, over the near term. Uh, so it puts them on a stronger financial footing. Uh, because one, one of the um, boxes that needs ticking for the energy transition is to, to have a strong financial framework and a strong yeah. balance sheet. So they still got progress. They still need to make progress in deleveraging, but um, higher prices and this much more disciplined approach to investment uh, is certainly helping. And um, we, we've seen pretty rapid deleveraging over the last couple of quarters. It also occurs to me, anyway, ironic that just when climate change is making investing in oil, shall we say, unfashionable, perhaps, the shale industry is finally becoming investable. 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You're seeing um, because there's a lot less um, investment as a proportion of operating cash flow, um, that, that that means more available for shareholders. So you're seeing uh, dividends increase, uh, more companies announce buybacks. Um, I guess is what you'd expect as the sector starts to mature. Um, you're, you're not chasing growth. Um, you're focusing more on the shareholder, whether that's uh, increasing dividends or buybacks. Now, now, we've seen, Tom, that energy supply is becoming more diverse. Utility suppliers, I'm thinking wind, solar, electricity producers, have traditionally achieved a much lower rate of return than the major oil and gas companies. Is this the beginning of the end for the highly profitable IOCs? Yeah, well, we have a lot of um, discussion with our clients around the relative returns. Um, I think what you have to remember is that wind and solar have a very different risk profile. Um, they don't have the same level of project execution risk. And typically, uh, the first 15 to 20 years of the project would be locked in. The, the, the price would be locked in through a power purchase agreement. Um, so it's very different to a traditional oil and gas project where uh, you're, you're exposed to that oil and gas pricing volatility. It's also worth bearing in mind, if you look back over the last decade, um, the oil and gas sector hasn't had a tremendous track record of delivering strong returns. Um, partly because um, uh, it wasn't disciplined enough, but of course there were two big price cycles which um, eroded value. Uh, so I think the one thing to bear in mind when you're comparing oil and gas with wind and solar is just a very different risk profile. Um, and uh, you know that's one reason that the Euro majors are embracing it, as, as well as the fact that it's got enormous growth potential. Yes, of course. I'd also like to touch on NOCs. Will they be able to uh... Should we say scoop what is left of the fossil fuel business? I mean, <laughs> are cross-border carbon taxes is somewhat inevitable? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's the sort of thing you would need to see to get um, to, to accelerate decarbonisation. Uh, but um, the NOCs are also embracing decarbonisation. And um, I think there's a recognition that in order to stay competitive, whether that's in LNG or oil, uh, you need carbon friendly barrels um, and that basically means sort of low carbon footprint. Uh, so uh, that, that they are looking at decarbonisation um, and uh, yeah, they, the, re the big resource holding NOCs um, should be among the last men standing. They've got the most economic barrels and um, many have the most carbon friendly barrels as well. You can't talk about energy these days without talking about hydrogen. Uh, and we see that oil and gas producers are now putting more research into blue hydrogen carbon capture and storage. Is this all a push to prevent totally stranded assets by 2050 if we become a net zero carbon world? Well, I think to get on that sort of two uh, and, and especially a 1.5 degree trajectory, you need all of these decarbonisation technologies to work. Um, that includes blue, green hydrogen and CCUS. And uh, the big target there is these sort of very hard to decarbonise sectors. Um, and uh, that needs to work and wind and solar needs to work and um, that needs government support. It needs a supportive regulatory environment. Um, and I think what you're going to see, Stephen, is just a lot more uh, collaboration and cooperation, both within the oil and gas sector, but uh, with other industries and probably even more importantly, with governments to help establish that supportive framework. Which governments do you think will take a lead in that cooperation? Because that's really vital, isn't it? It is. I mean, I, we're sort of seeing it happen in, in Europe in many ways. And I've described Europe as a bit of a test bed for industrial decarbonisation. And um, it, it, it's sort of a, a big reflection of just where they are in terms of the net zero agenda politically. Uh, but also it's a more mature oil and gas sector. And uh, there are opportunities within there to to to. Um, initiate carbon capture projects that are also very close to industrial clusters, um, just the way uh, logistically things work in Europe. So Europe, Europe is definitely a market to, to watch, and you're certainly seeing quite a lot of the majors and other companies uh, get more involved in these um, industrial projects where you've got blue hydrogen and CCUS linked into um, large industrial hubs. Uh, briefly, Tom, sort of, how would you sum up the viability of blue hydrogen? 
Yeah, so the, the way we look at um, blue and green hydrogen and CCUS is it's a more long dated option on decarbonisation. So wind and solar um, are happening now and you, you've got enormous growth potential and, uh, and uh, even now that that's sort of going ahead. Um, the, the, the technology and well, the, the economics um, still need to be worked through for um, these decarbonisation technologies such as CCUS and, and blue hydrogen. So that's sort of where going back to my point around supportive policy and regulation. Um, it's a little bit like where wind and solar was at maybe 10, five, 10 years ago. And um, you need government support. So some of the CCUS projects, for instance, have big government grants and uh, a lot of the capex is actually being um, shouldered by by the state. Um, so these are the sorts of things you need to see in order to establish a foundation to really scale up these technologies post 2030, which, you know, that's when we really need them to deliver the goods to get on that two degree trajectory. Which isn't that far away. It's not very far away. You've got to remember that oil and gas, it's a very capital intensive uh, sector and these types of projects, depending on their scale, um, can be very capital intensive as well. So you need to ensure that you're investing that capital wisely. So that's why uh, a priority needs to be sort of establishing these frameworks and the uh, and collaborating across the board in order uh, to, to build up platforms for this longer term expansion. Indeed. Uh, many IOCs support national rentier uh, economies. Do you see uh, increased adaptation to climate change realities in these economies? Yeah, we do. And um, I mean, you're seeing in, in Qatar, for instance, they're using, um, they've got plans for carbon capture for the next wave of LNG projects. And uh, that's part of uh, uh, decarbonizing their, their products. So um, it, it opens up more market potential. And, um, and, and then you're starting to see other resource holding states um, diversify or start to diversify away from oil and gas. So sort of all of this is with an eye on, on the energy transition. Um, and, and of course, in the Middle East, you've got a lot of sun, so there, there's opportunities there for, for renewables. It's still quite early days, but um, you know, I think you can say the same for a lot of the IOCs as well. They're still getting to grips with uh, what is the strategy that, that fits their core competencies and, and their outlook for the future. Well, on that note, Tom, we'll conclude our conversation. I'd like to thank you very much for joining the Foundation and sharing your views and what may well be the future of IOCs and NOCs. Thank you. And watch this space for the next Al Alatia podcast in the series. I'd also like to remind all our listeners to please visit the Foundation's website at www.abhafoundation.org and follow the Foundations on Twitter at, uh, at Al Alatia FNDN. I'm Stephen Cole. Thank you and goodbye.